Christy hadn't been feeling good this week, and so multiple times this week, I took our granddaughter Emily to school in the morning and picked her up, and she's in this mode where every day now she asks you, what are you going to call me today? And you can say whatever, and whatever you say is always the wrong thing, but some days she wants to be a princess, some days she just wants to be Emily, some days she wants to be granddaughter, ladybug. So she has all these different things. And so she was asking me, so what are you going to call me today as soon as we left? And uh, so I just named off everything I could absolutely think of. And so then she didn't know what to say because I just didn't give her one. I gave her every one that she'd called herself in the past month, month and a half. And so I just went on and on and on. And I said, so. Emily, what is the greatest name of all? Out of all the names you have, what is your absolute favorite? And she goes, my absolute favorite is I am the house of God because he lives in here. <laughs> and that wasn't even one of the names I gave her in the whole list of what she'd been calling herself that week. But See, it just goes to show me that, uh, that sometimes we think we come up with these ideas, but the message I wrote for today is God with us. Okay. And so she obviously has no idea, and this is in the morning on the way to school, and she says, you know, that's the most important name you can ever have, Grandpa. I'm not going to drink it. And you know what? It is. And I, I think so many times we just forget the significance of that because one of the most fascinating developments through the whole Bible, through the whole storyline, is the concept of God dwelling with his people. And I gotta tell you, it's it's fundamental. You know how we always say, you know what, if you want to get something done, you gotta go back to the basics? Just think about this. God put Adam and Eve in the garden to be there with him. I mean, that was his whole plan. And he was there with them all the time. And I gotta tell you, the more I read the biblical scriptures, the more I read, I really believe God lived there in the garden with Adam and Eve. And, and I've said this a lot of times, but for those of you who haven't, haven't heard it, the name Eden in Hebrew means perfect pleasure. So it said, God put Adam and Eve in the center of the garden. And so what it's really saying is, he put Adam and Eve in the center of his perfect pleasure. And where was his perfect pleasure? Right in the middle of where he was. And then some people go, well, that's crazy. But it's not crazy when you follow the whole biblical context all the way through. Because what happened? Even when we got separated from God through Adam and Eve's sin... Even when the whole separation came, even as other things moved along, God always was there to be in the middle of his people. Even when the people tried to do other things, God brought it back and he centered it on himself. And he wasn't saying a center like, you must look at me. He was a center where he just inserted himself right in the middle and made himself available. And we need to understand is that God's whole plan is always to be with us. It's always been to be in us. When you get all the way after the flood in Noah's time, and then Abram, and then they get separated from God again, and then he sends in Moses, what happens? He came down and he said, build a tabernacle so I can be right here in what? In the midst, in the middle of all my people. And then he said, all right. You guys need rules and regulations? This is how you set up. But how was it all set up? It was set up just like it was in Eden, where God was in the center and everybody else was around and they were right in the middle of his presence. When he set up his home in Jerusalem, in, in the temple, what did he say? Put it right in the center and everybody else is around. So we got to understand is, is God doesn't demand that we serve him, but he wants to be in the center of what we're doing. And when we start to understand is, is when we put God in the center, things change. But it's no longer about us and it's about God. And it's no longer about 
all these things, then God could be in the center. Just like in that song, you know what? You know how God moves the mountain? He moves the mountain when we're no longer looking at the mountain and we're looking at Him. Last night, Christy was listening to Todd White, and you know, you, you need to, I, I love Todd, but sometimes, you know, you need to be able to take the meat and throw away the bones, but he did bring out, you know, that God moves the mountains, and he wants to keep us out of the valley, and so God's kind of like the center point. You know, I really believe God puts us in valleys sometimes, lets us go in valleys sometimes, and sometimes we climb the mountaintop so we can see what was out in front of us. But there is a reality that God wants to bring some normality to our life. And if we just worry about the valleys and then we celebrate on the peak and then we worry about the valley and we celebrate on the peak, it's like riding a roller coaster and you have thrills and you have dips. And you know what? I don't believe that's how, that's how God wants us to live. I mean, he does want us to have thrills, and he does want us to learn in those times, but his perfect will is that we're with him. And I don't think Adam and Eve in the garden, because you've got to go back to, that was the perfect utopia, that was the plan, and he keeps bringing it back around, back around, back around, back around, so that he's right there in the center. That his plan is that there be an even keel in our life, but the problem is, is that, when we're walking with God, when God does something, we reach a high. And then when God does something that we don't agree with, or things don't go exactly our way, we reach a low. Isn't it true? When life in general throws up obstacles. I was talking with somebody yesterday that they, they just retired and stuff. And... Uh, they said, we're not going to be at church on Sunday because we're going to Arizona because I don't like the cold and we have family there that wants to see us. <laughs> and so we're retired and so we don't have anything pressing. So we just went bought tickets and we're going to Arizona for a week because it's supposed to be cold all week and just because we can. <laughs> you see, we can let things depress us and we can let things take us down. Or we can just move into the fullness of what God has. You know what? God's given us that freedom. And, and that to me was a perfect example of freedom. See, they're no longer bound to a job. And they have the money in the bank. And they had the time. And it isn't even that it's about money. It's the fact is, is that they were just able to go and do what they wanted to do. And see, there's freedom in that. And I, I really believe that that's how God wants us to live. He wants us to live in that freedom. He wants us to live in the fullness of what he has and he doesn't want us to live on that roller coaster. And a lot of times that roller coaster starts because of what we do in the positions we put ourselves in. It's, it's the things that we focus on in life sometimes. See, God the creator of everything that exists He gradually, throughout time, has revealed His presence over and over and over. And He reveals His presence to those that belong to Him. I think so many times that we've been, uh, we, we read a scripture, and just because of what somebody said at some point in time, and then it's just been perpetuated forever, that it just becomes true to us. One of those truths that I believe since the day I was saved, because people just taught us that, is that you can't look on God, otherwise you're going to die. But as I start reading the scripture, he told Moses that. Is that not true? He said, Moses, you can't even look at me, otherwise you die. You're going to have to look at my reflection in the cleft of the rock. I don't know all the circumstances there, but i got to tell you, God appeared many other times to people. And they didn't die. You're, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, guess what? Moses, it said Moses would go to the front door of the tabernacle and God would talk with Moses, not like other men, but face to face. And it said when Moses went up to the door of the tabernacle, that God would show up, he would talk to Moses face to face, and 
the cloud would move or the pillar of fire would move and everybody would come out to their door and what would they start to do? They would begin to worship God is what the scripture tells us. We go, okay, well, Moses was special. And it said, and then Moses would leave that place and all the people would gather to hear what God had told Moses. But it said Joshua would remain at the door. Well, what that tells me is, is God was also talking to Joshua. And Joshua obviously didn't die because every time God spoke to Moses, which was all the time, Joshua would remain at the door and Joshua was then being trained. He was being equipped to one day take Moses' place, even though nobody saw that whole plan unfold. And so I can read into the text is, I really believe what God told Moses and what God told Joshua sometimes may be meshed, but they weren't the same exact thing. Why? Because they were two different people with two different callings on their life for leading the same people, but one was only going to take them so far, and he was preparing the younger one to take them far enough. You see, the great part is, is in the Old Testament you had to go to God, and in the New Testament God comes to you. They had to go to God to do offerings. They had to go to God to do all these things. In the New Testament, wherever we are, God is. Why? Because He dwells in us. As we trace the progression of, of God going to His people, It, it just brings great times of worship, and it also brings great times of hope. You know, if you really think about it, the moment you were saved, the moment you came to know Jesus, think of the joy you had in your life. Think of the exuberance you had. Think about the excitement, you know. Most people, when they're first saved, if nobody else stopped, they'll preach to their dog. Why? Because somebody's going to get saved today. <laughs> And I don't care if it's a fish, I don't care if it's a dog, I don't care if it's a person on the corner, I don't care if it's the, the person at the gas station, and they don't really care about what other people in line think, they're going to preach to the checker. Why? Because they just got saved. The neighbor they don't like, all of a sudden they're going to tell them about everything that just happened in their life. But you know what? We reach a point where we lose that excitement. Why? Because we stop focusing on what God did and what God is doing and we start focusing on everything else. And that's one of the key things in Christianity is that we stop focusing on what God is doing and what God has done or we just focus on what He's done and we just say, that was good enough. And then the enemy comes in and tells you, well, that's all you were worthy of. It's not what we were worthy of. We're worthy of everything all the time. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of the Most High King. Amen. After God rescued the Israelites from Egypt, God commanded them to make His sanctuary that He could dwell in their midst. That's Exodus 25, 8. See, the children of Israel had fallen so far away from God I want you to think about the whole biblical context here. You had the flood of Noah, and then the earth gets repopulated, and then you have the Tower of Babel, and then God scatters the people, and then God chooses Abram. And then he starts over at square one, and everywhere Abram goes, people know. The king said, why did you lie to me? I almost slept with your wife and I would have been cursed. Well, how did he know that? God revealed it to him. Abram wasn't boasting about it. God revealed it to that man. Why? Because if he would have done that, God would have had to punish him and God didn't want him to be held responsible for something that Abram wasn't telling him. You see, God was in charge. God was there. Everywhere Abram went, God was there. Think about it. How else did that king know unless God revealed it to him? See, because God was there. Wherever we go, God is. Do you realize that we really don't have a private life? God knows everything. 
Sometimes we think we can hide, we can act one way one day of the week and another way another day of the week. Sometimes we think that, that God doesn't know what we're going through. He doesn't know our struggles. You know what? He's with us all the time. And I got to tell you is, we can either fight against that or we can flow with that. But if you fight against it, you're not going to go anywhere because God's always there. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to turn his back. He's not going to close his eyes. He's not going to give you private time even in the bathroom. I mean, let's just get real. God is always there. And so when we start thinking that we can hide things from him, then we're just literally doing the work for the enemy. Why? Because we're agreeing with his plan for our life instead of God's plan for our life. And then once we even get close to that line, everything starts slipping. Everything starts slipping off to the side. We, we can't even get close to that line. And the, really the bottom line, the, the, the key to the whole thing is just realizing A, who God is, and B, that He wants to dwell with us. And C, that the plans He has for us are good. See, God gave the Israelites a new hope, a new identity, when He rescued them from the Egyptians. They went from God's promised people. He provided for them in the famine. Joseph went before Him, even under bad circumstances. God took totally horrible circumstances in Joseph and went from Him being sold as a slave to Him being over all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh, with the full authority of Pharaoh even without Pharaoh knowing. I mean, he had the signet ring. And God used that to save all the descendants of Israel. And the next thing you know, he went from a slave to provision to everybody being a slave again. See, it was just a cycle. It was that up and down. But even in the midst of that, God showed up again through Moses and he took them from that to freedom and hope once again. You see, God's story is repeating over and over and over. And it, it just goes to show me the, the factual truth when it says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Look at what God has done, starting with Abram, starting with Adam. Every time the people rebelled, he made a way for them to come back. Every time the people rebelled, don't let the enemy tell you there's no hope for you because people rebelled way worse than you've ever rebelled in history. And you can read it in his love letter to us and you can see that he'll always accept us back. The only thing we're missing is the time that we chose to be away. He revealed his intention to have his, to have his presence continually with him. With the children of Israel, he revealed himself. And he says, you know what? I'm going to dwell right here in the middle of you. When you think about the tabernacle and the temple that followed, and God living amongst his people once again, you know, how incredible it must have been for the people, and how incredible it must have been for God to see his plan coming back together. How many of us have had a plan and you start to walk in that plan and everything's going good and things fall apart? I mean, you start down a plan and things just fall apart. And then you start on something and everything starts lining up and things fall apart. It happens all the time. We've been on this venture of selling our house been under contract three times and all three times little stupid things have made it fall apart and the crazy part is is we've had three houses under contract and every time our contract falls apart it goes on the market and that house instantly sells and then we're out of bowl. <laughs> then you start all over at square one again. Now you can stop and say alright what's going on here but the fact is you know what God's plan doesn't end. Just because something goes awry, then that means God has something else. And who knows what that something else is? Now, you can choose to focus on the negative things, or you can choose to focus on the positive things. 
You can choose to understand that God's in control of your life. You know what? God knows where we're going to live. He knows when we're going to move. And so I don't have to get all stressed about it. I'm not perfect. It isn't that you can't get stressed about it. It isn't that you don't get sad. It isn't that you don't get upset. But the fact is, is that you just got to immediately brush that off and step back to center and just say, all right, God, so that didn't work out, so you must have something else. So what is the time frame and what is it? You can just throw up your hands and give up, but you know what? God doesn't want us to give up. He wants us to walk and go through. There was an 11-day journey from where the Ten Commandments came to the Promised Land. And after 40 years, the children of Israel never walked into that promise. But you know what? The promise from day one was only 11 days away. And as they went around the mountain, sometimes it was probably 12 hours away on that one side of the mountain. But you know what? Every time they walked by the promise of God, they chose to walk around the mountain again. And you know what? Everything's the same today. Sometimes we're within that 12 hours of walking in the promise of God and we choose to walk back around the mountain for whatever the reason may be. And you know what? It isn't that God ever cursed all those people. They just never got with God's program and so they all had to die before the children of Israel could go in. But God's promise was still the same. And if 20 years in, I fully believe if 20 years in, if they would have repented and fell down and said, God, this is where we're at, they could have walked right in the promised land. <laughs> See, God's plan didn't change, but the people chose not to walk into his plan. If you wonder why you're not walking in the fullness of God, when you wonder why, I just want to encourage you to step back, quit looking at what others have said, and I'm not... I'm not invalidating that. People have been hurt by churches. People have been hurt by leaders. People have been hurt by, by religion. People have been hurt by Christians. People have been hurt by pastors. Throw all that out the window and understand that you're not following a person or a church. You're following God. Amen. Amen. And if you're going to be in the fullness of where you want to be, the children of Israel were called to follow Moses. Those that didn't follow Moses didn't go anywhere. Those that did follow Moses stayed there. But then even within that group that were following Moses, all those ones died. Why? Because they chose to listen to the report of the ten and not the two. Two focused on what God said was in the land. And ten focused on what they saw with their own eyes, which was a reality. What they saw were the giants. What they saw was the obstacles. What they saw was the walls. What they saw was the hard work. What they saw was there was a battle before them. What they seem to forget is, is God said the battle was already won. God said that he had already given the land onto them. 